Are you the end consumer in a supply chain that systematically exploits workers? A recent report suggests that it's highly likely the clothes you're wearing right now were produced using unfair practices. Cheap fashion relies on cheap labour and that's affecting up to 12 million people in Bangladesh. Our fashion choices are putting their lives at risk. I'm Melinda Nusafora, and today's newsmaker is the Bangladeshi clothing industry. Bangladesh is the second largest garment exporter in the world. The industry is a cornerstone of the South Asian nation's economy and has helped to lift many of its 160 million people out of poverty. When Bangladesh started exporting ready-made garments in the 1970s, the industry constituted less than 4% of the country's total exports. By 2019, that had increased to 84%, making it the country's most important export sector. But it also renders the industry extremely vulnerable. A recent survey of over 1,000 garment factories found major global brands have been engaging in what the report described as unfair practices. The industry, hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, high inflation and widespread layoffs has little recourse. So let's take a look at just some of the problems facing Bangladesh's clothing industry. Fashion brands are extracting their wealth from some of the world's poorest countries in what constitutes a form of 21st century neo-colonialism. That's according to a recent study from Aberdeen University in Scotland. Co-author Professor Pamela Abbott says major high street fashion brands are paying suppliers in Bangladesh less than the cost of production and buying from factories that are struggling to pay minimum wage, which is less than $3 per day. Over 50% of suppliers in the survey report unfair purchasing practices, including order cancellations, refusal to pay, price reductions, or delayed payments. And the majority of Bangladeshi factories that sell to 24 of the largest global retailers said that these companies have been paying them the same prices since the start of the pandemic, despite global inflation and the increasing cost of raw materials. And these are giant brands, including Gap, Zara, H&M and Primark. Not a single supplier who reported contract breaches in the study has taken legal action against the retailers. Bangladesh depends on the ready-made garment industry, even though its workers face long hours and appalling conditions in cramped and hazardous factories. It generates 85% of Bangladesh's export income, which is about 20% of the country's gross domestic production, and it employs more than 4 million workers, with an additional 8 million Bangladeshis dependent on the sector. The study recommends that governments should regulate their brands and retailers to prevent unfair purchasing practices and to address the unequal power dynamic between suppliers and buyers. Because ultimately, when retailers breach contract terms or fail to pay, it's the workers who suffer. So how do we break this consumer cycle? Well, to answer that question and more, I'm joined by Fiona Gooch in London, She's a senior policy advisor at the UK advocacy group Transform Trade. Amir al Amin joins us from Dhaka. He's the president of the National Garment Workers Federation. And also in London is Tamara Jinjik, the CEO and founder of Fashion Roundtable and the UK's all-party parliamentary group for ethics and sustainability in fashion. Thank you all for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Amiral, I want to start with you. You're there in Dhaka. Do you think the average consumer in other parts of the world have an accurate understanding of just how dire the working conditions are in some of these factories? 
uh, I think uh, most of the con consumer uh, of the North, they are not actually solely aware uh, about the condition of the workers in Bangladesh and as well as in the South. So you see, uh, like you see in, the, in Bangladesh, there are 1,000 factories and 4.2 million workers are working in this sector. And 70% of the total uh, workforce, they are the women. And this garment industry, they actually cover 83% of our total export. Mm. It means this sector actually earning the major part of the foreign currency, foreign money. But the condition of the workers really very poor until now. The lowest wage for the workers, it is uh, 8,000 taka. 8,000 taka, now it is uh, $80, $80 US dollar in a month. So mm. other thing, many of the workers, they actually work 12 to 14 hours in a day. Many cases, they work seven days in a week. And the women workers, they are actually facing a lot of problems. Most of the factories, there is no daycare center or child care center. Mm. So the mother, the mother worker, they actually keep their small kids, maybe 500 kilometers far away mm -hmm. with their uh, grand, grandmother. Maybe in a year, twice, they can see their small kids. You I'm just going to interrupt you just for a moment there, um, Amaril, because I just want to pick up on a couple of the things that you've mentioned and put those to Fiona. We've heard Amaril outlining some of these very difficult working conditions. We've seen it in this report, but it's nothing particularly new. These problems that have been surrounding fast fashion have been known for years. So why isn't the current messaging making any difference? So I think the key thing to bring out, which we have brought out with the recent University of Aberdeen report, looking at the impact of retailers' unfair trading practices with their garment manufacturers, is some of the key driving force behind these bad working conditions is actually and probably resulting from the purchasing practices based in the consumer market. So action has to be taken both in consumer markets to stop unfair purchasing practices, as well as work, excellent work that is being done in a number of different production countries to improve the working conditions. So what we are drawing out now is rather than always focusing on production countries, we need to look at the decisions made in the offices and the corridors of the high street retailers that the names that we are all so familiar with. And that's what this recent report has brought out, is the largest uh, survey conducted of clothing manufacturers that I am aware of in the world. So mm. 1,000 Bangladeshi factories interviewed about their experience of selling to their international customers. And what it brings out is that more than 50% of all of those uh, factories experience unfair trading practices. And to be clear about what unfair trading practices are, that means not paying what you previously agreed. That means not buying what you previously said that you would buy and also paying extremely late. Mm. And I can come on to more details about the larger ones being worse. And I think the key thing to say about that is that 90% of the larger high street brands buying from four or more factories were engaging in unfair purchasing practices. And then when you look at the even smaller group of um, brands that were buying from 15 or more factories, and in some cases, more than 100, well, absolutely every single one of those brands was subjecting their factories to at least one type of unfair practice. And Tamara, and reason... do you agree with, sorry to interrupt you there, Fiona, I just want to put that to Tamara. Do you agree with what Fiona is saying there about where the buck stops? Who really is to blame? We've been focusing on factory owners, but should the focus be 
on the companies and the consumers? Completely, you have to you have to see this all in the round. So it's it's been a race to the bottom. You have a situation where people buy more than they did a generation ago, and they still are looking for bargains. And I don't think that the consumer has been completely complicit in this. I think it's been an issue where brands have looked for cheaper, faster, um, and with less regulation. Uh, companies have have been pushed to to sell more at cheaper and the person who's paying for that is the garment worker these are women in the global south who who as we've heard in these testimonies are are being exploited again and again and um and until we address those issues issues which as you've rightly said are not new these have been going on now for well over 15 years 20 years a generation we will we will continue to escalate that and if we don't deal with it in bangladesh it will it will relocate elsewhere as it has been but who polices these companies, Tamara? Who polices a, a global fashion brand? How can we stop this well, from happening? The, the issue is there's a lot of marking your own homework going on. So there's a lot of people setting up um, alliances where it's ultimately the brands not working with unions, not therefore working with the workers, um, who are defining what is and isn't good practice. So I'm sure we'll come on to what Transform Trade are looking at, which mm. is a, a garment adjudicator, which is currently waiting for its second reading as a private member's bill um, in the House of Commons. Um, and I think that would be a way of um, making the UK in particular um, address the issues of its, of its practices. The reason why that's important is a lot of the international brands are domicile headquartered in the UK. Um, and the EU and other territories are looking at these issues. But um, I want to emphasise that if we don't address what's going on in Bangladesh, um, without looking at, at, the, at the issue in the round, then all we will see is a relocation of these poor practices as we've seen into other territories. Mm. Uh, I might jump on that. Let's talk about these practices in Bangladesh. Uh, th this is not just um, commercial unfair practices that we've uh, been hearing about. It's also domestic issues within these factories around sexual exploitation, for example. Is there enough being done domestically in Bangladesh to improve these conditions? I, I think my, my comment is that if retailers do not pay suppliers as they expected, that means that suppliers do not have the confidence to plan production and therefore employ workers in an orderly manner without forced overtime without realizing that the targets have all changed at the last minute on that day people have got to stay later they're put under pressure to work harder all because of decisions made thousands of miles away to change what had previously been agreed that is a type of unfair purchasing practice so my sense is that those challenges which occur in production factories caused internationally that's what we need to deal from the consumer market. But in terms of the actions being undertaken in different production countries to improve conditions, I think Amin will speak better to that. Uh, while we've got you there, Fiona, let's talk about this fashion watchdog. What is it? How can it police what's happening outside of its borders? So... Let, let me also just take another step back in terms of one other comment that's been made. I do not feel that it is fair on consumers to go shopping and expect them to be able to make really, really difficult and complex decisions about where to buy from, who to buy from. The, the issue is that you are faced with clothes made in really desperate conditions in many, many, many different shops. And knowing who to buy from is, is would require multiple PhDs to be able to understand and make that decision. Mm. So the issue is that the UK government is happy to allow British retailers to put on the shelf for British consumers products where the British retailers have chosen to treat their factories with unfair trading practices. That is a market problem. We have already been able to solve it in the food sector. So back in 2013, we established in the UK something called the Groceries Code Adjudicator. 
to stop unfair purchasing practices being perpetrated by the 14 largest food retailers in the UK. And the Groceries Code Adjudicator has been incredibly successful at reducing them. Unfortunately, they aren't at zero. But in 2013, when a survey was conducted of all the suppliers selling to the um, retailers, the su suppliers that responded to that said that they were, 79% of those suppliers said that they did experience breaches of the fair purchasing code that the food retailers should have abided by. And so do you see a fashion watchdog operating in a similar manner? Exactly. And by the time we got to 2021, that groceries code adjudicator had managed to reduce the instances of breaches of this fair purchasing code down to 29%. But what is concerning is that because the whole world is in a situation where we've got raw material price increases, huge amounts of inflation, what we've got happening exactly at the point of retail is raw material prices have gone up, huge desire to keep the costs down for consumers, and that absolute squeeze point is happening at retailers and brands. Now, in the food retail sector, what we have at the moment, thanks to this regulator being in place, is a process where people can discuss their raw material price increases. Hmm. No such process exists for the fashion sector. Tamara, so can I ask got... you, sorry to interrupt you there, I just want to put this to Tamara, if we've only got this operating in the UK, that is assuming that it does uh, become adopted uh, after its second reading, can a watchdog in one country make any difference when you think about consumers all across Europe, all across America? Is it enough? I think it's a good start, but other territories are also looking at this issue. You've got you've got a lot of uh, work happening in the EU, which is currently leading in this space, and you've had work going on in in um, in the US as well. So I don't think that this would be an isolated opportunity for uh, improving workers' rights. I, look, there's a growing demographic of consumers who want to buy clothes which are sustainably and ethically made. Um, and equally, as Fiona spoke of, you can't expect the consumer, and I, I don't think it's ever been right to blame the consumer for the choices made by brands and manufacturers. It is not their fault that the clothes are being made in those conditions or are being placed at that price point. It has normalised a race to the bottom. And this is the problem then, isn't it? There is a growing number of consumers who want to make ethical choices but those ethical choices can be prohibitively expensive. Uh, Fiona, do we need to completely change our expectations of what it costs to produce clothing? That is a very good question, and we don't actually know necessarily where the fair price point is. What is very clear is that the price points that are currently being paid are not enough to live on. So it does not enable a living wage. So, but the other component that is connected to that is the real importance that factories who ultimately are the employers can plan. So there are multiple components for ensuring that workers are able to go to work, come leave work when they expect it, fulfill childcare and other responsibilities. And that's not achievable when we've got these unfair purchasing practices, both in terms of commitments to volume, technical changes, pricing, payment terms. It's actually a broader array than just price mm. is what we're looking at. And the other thing that I wanted to bring out is that the um, fair purchasing code applies to whoever the retailers are that fall under scope of the new fashion watchdog and any of their suppliers, wherever they are in the world. That is the way that it has been established for food. Mm -hmm. And like we have at a European level, the unfair trading practices for agri-food, there is a need at a European level also to explore the possibility for a directive that's dedicated to the fashion sector also to stop unfair purchasing practices, because they also have uh, got the experience and the model in, in agri-food. So it's not just the UK, it's actually Europe that can also uh, adopt a similar model. Right. We seem to have Amaral back, so I'm going to take this opportunity and hope that your connection is strong enough, Amaral, so we can ask you, 
not a single factory or supplier during this report, uh, during this survey, has come out to say that they've taken any brand to court for breaches, uh, for failing to pay, for failing to uh, stand up to their side of the, of the deals. Why not? Why don't these factories take the brands to court? Uh, I think uh, the, uh, our sellers, uh, it means the factory owners, and they actually... We are still having a uh, slight really problem um, hearing you there, Amaral. So the I'm just going to ask um, Tamara, if the Bangladeshi factory owners don't feel empowered to take these brands to court, should international manufacturing associations be doing more on their behalf? I think there's a lot going on on the ground uh, with NGOs in Bangladesh. Um, when we did um, evidence for a report that we worked on for the Ethics and Sustainability or Party Parliamentary Group, we took evidence from a number of NGOs and factory owners in Bangladesh who were all trying to do um, uh, to support good practice and, and, and fair fair living conditions and wages for workers. And this was also being written during the pandemic where we haven't touched on this, but there was an escalated um, incidence um, in uh, poverty, uh, in, in non-payments and in violence towards um, gender-based violence towards a lot of the workers. Mm. A lot of the workers in these factories are women. Um, a lot of the workers don't even have bank accounts. If they're women, they're less likely to than the men. I was just reading up. I've been reading up a lot of evidence this morning, just to recap. So this is this is an issue around the dichotomy of power. You have the least empowered at the bottom of the supply chain who are making our clothes. You have a consumer who is not as informed or as able to be as uh, aware of transparency because it's such an opaque supply chain. It's very complex. And then you have people who might not want to, to become more transparent because it suits their purposes. Mm. If brands, as they purport, wish to change towards greater transparency, that's to be applauded and, we, and they need to be supported to make those changes, but they also need to be held to account to make those changes. They can't keep marking their own homework, which is why at Fashion Roundtable, we support the idea of the fashion watchdog simply because we need more legislative, hard, that's a hard word for me to say, processes in place in order to support greater transparency because everybody is saying that's what they want mm. and then let's do it. Um, Fiona, I saw you indicating you, you had a comment to that question as well, but also, can I also ask you, has there ever been a case where a manufacturing group, a factory, has ever received any compensation for these unfair and unethical practices? So we were in touch with quite a few manufacturers, uh, certainly during the pandemic, and um, were encouraging and supporting different um, factories to write pre-court action letters to brands and retailers about these unfair trading practices, particularly because the consequences of them not earning enormous, I mean, we're talking millions of pounds, was that people were going to have to possibly close factories and they certainly hadn't been able to pay workers as they had planned. Not a single one of the manufacturers that we are in touch with ever initiated court proceedings. Mm. The pre-court action letters may have resulted in them earning a little bit more, but nowhere near what they are owed. And the reason why uh, manufacturers do not take their customers to court is that they are desperate for more and future orders and don't ever want to be known or seen in the public domain as perhaps being a troublemaker. Mm. So just as Amin said, they don't challenge. Amira, well, I can see you nodding your head there. Is that a big consideration? If these factories are seen to be troublemakers, will they have in effect lose their contracts? And that means all of their staff are out of work. If uh, this manufacturer they bring any case against of the brands or retailers in future, so in future almost all the brands or retailers they will try to boycott these manufacturers or these factory owners. That is the reason the uh, local factory owners they actually do not uh, do not put the case 
against the brands and retailers in the core mm. because this is actually the their business relationship so they think that if today i make a case against a brand maybe in future i will lose the order not only from this brand even all the other brands mm. also follow these things and they will also not provide any order to this particular factory. Mm. So It is a very difficult situation and there are so many more questions I want to ask all of you, but unfortunately we've run out of time. I thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you to our audience. Thank you for watching this episode of Newsmakers. You can follow us on Twitter and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Melinda Nusifora. We'll see you next time.